I hope you guys have been enjoying your time down here. Good. And I think um, you guys are going to have more fun this evening. A lot of your concerns are going to be addressed as we um, regard to recapitalization. Um, talking about recapitalization, it's not just going to be a presentation, it's going to be more of a dialogue. We are here to hear from you and as well, you also hearing what we are planning as regards to recapitalization. So we are going to be discussing the opportunities and challenges that recapitalization have been facing in different uh, facilities. And uh, we we'll certainly have uh, some life examples to help you in future if you have such plan. So with that being said, we are going to be looking at um, what NSF presume recapitalization to be, then what, the, what are the importance of recapitalization, then some life examples of recapitalization mechanisms that have been used within NSF, then uh, what we are considering and would like to hear from you what you think about recapitalization. And also during this um, dialogue, we are going to be having, like I mentioned before, some life examples. You'll be hearing directly from uh, different facility uh, managers, management, um, safety officers, uh, facility managers and all. So, and that would be wonderful. And uh, that will also give you um, the opportunity to connect with these folks as soon as this um, uh, dialogue is over. And uh, finally, we'll be having um, a survey at the end of this um, dialogue. And that survey will actually need your candid um, opinion. So that will help us, inf that will inform our plan on recapitaliz uh, recapitalization. I think uh, what we presume uh, recapitalization to be is um, a kind of a uh, replacement, renewal, upgrade of capital assets during operations to retain efficacy and improve efficiency. These activities are typically larger in size than annual maintenance and would often involve a facility major stop system and components. Then in funding terms, recapitalization is considered as a periodic reoccurring, uh, reoccurring cost for replacement renewal projects and one-time funding for improvements, upgrade, and other programmatic uh, uh, projects. And uh, first of all, I think uh, I know a lot of you will be wondering, like, what, is the, what does this mean to us? What will this do for us? And we are here to actually tell you a little bit about what we think at NSF. And I, we think it's actually uh, important recapitalization is actually important to keep the research facility scientifically relevant, to maximize the useful life of the research facility, to improve the efficiency and lower the cost of research facilities, and as well to maintain the compliance and the building codes and standard, and also to maintain the value um, of the research facility and to improve the appearance and the working environment. And I am sure, very sure um, as you walked into NCA building this morning, a lot of you were like surprised uh, considering the age of NCA and the way it looks. It's all part of, it's all maintenance recapitalization at work. So and um, recapitalization needs are informed by the facility condition assessment. And I think um, a lot of us here have been uh, part of the presentation that have been ongoing as regards uh, facility condition assessment. So, and uh, there was a question that actually came up and I think uh, that question will be addressed during this section. So some of the reasons for recapitalization dialogue is for us to share experience, is for this community to share experience with um, NSF, uh, uh, to share experience with existing NSF recapitalization mechanism, what has worked in the past and what didn't work, 
what you like to see in future or what you are thinking will be a better way to handle recapitalization. There are also to stress the linkage to facility condition assessments and the need for proper justification. Over time, ensure NSF uh, funded research infrastructure is operating optimally. So those are some of the reasons for recapitalization of this um, dialogue. And I think the biggest thing we want to get from you guys, um, as in from this community, is to actually get your input, the, uh, to seek your input um, into the uh, research uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure guide. We are trying to come up with probably a section, depends on how this goes, probably a section in the research infrastructure guide that will help inform the, uh, our recipients on how to navigate recapitalization when it comes to their facility. Um, these are the recapitalization mechanisms that have been used in NSF, uh, at NSF. And the first and foremost is the supplemental funding request. Then we have the competitive uh, proposal as well as the uh, inclusion as budget line in the O&M award. And uh, we'll be looking at some of the life examples of this. For supplemental funding request, NCA, uh, I will have um, NCA, uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Reed from NCA, tell us a little bit about how they've used supplemental funding requests in the past in NCA facilities, the aviation facility. And as well, uh, MATLAB, uh, which is the NHMLF. I think you should be friends with Google when you work with NSF because you definitely need to understand the acronyms. You don't really need to know it, but just like when you hear it, you know what we are talking about. So make Google your friend and that will help. And um, so in the past, I think MATLAB actually requested a supplemental funding request to support the purchase of major equipment in need of refurbishment and uh, replacement that includes the vacuum pump and cooling towers. Then um, LIGO is another example that have used the supplemental funding request for their vacuum system sustainment. And um, Hannah will be talking to that later on. Then we have um, for the competitive proposal, this will include our, our mid-scale, which is um, the mid-scale track one and the mid-scale track two. And I know all morning, you guys have been hearing a lot about the mid-scale track one and mid-scale track two. So I wouldn't want to waste anybody's time trying to like uh, tell you anything about it. You've heard it all from the pros and I think that's good enough. So um, the shipboard scientific support equipment uh, program, they've utilized this kind of mechanism to um, as, a, as a kind of uh, recapitalization mechanism in their facility. And the purpose was to improve, was to improve safety, promote reg, uh, regulatory compliance and enhance scientific, uh, scientific capacity and productivity for vessels of the US Academy research uh, fleet. They also provided um, the, the shipment scientific support equipment, provided funds for the ship equipment. And I think you can see the uh, other things that this uh, particular um, mechanism was used for. Then we have uh, another mechanism that has been used at NSF, which is inclusion as part of the O&M budget. And, um, this we've done, uh, Anchor did this um, some time back, and I think it's a multi year uh, accumulation of funds over the duration of the life of the OM award to support the significant uh, periodic and episodic maintenance and capital expenditure at the NSF title building. So the aircraft maintenance and upgrade and high performance computing infrastructure. So ENCA, um, they call their program the Scientific uh, Project Encuberance Request, which is the um, SPAF. So what they did uh, for, they actually used the Scientific uh, Project Encuberance Request for high dollar activities that 
cannot be entirely supported from a single year budget without seriously depleting funds available for basic research programs and operations. They also use this same um, uh, science uh, project and cuberance request for the replacement of a super computer or aircraft engines. This also was used to uh, for cost of high dollar projects that were this the cost of high dollar projects uh, were spread over several years. So and also the funds were drawn just before the expenditure. So if you will be hearing more about this later on in the presentation. Then um, we also have another good example, which is the major overhaul stabilization uh, account, which is called uh, MOSA. So uh, MOSA, well, major overhaul stabil stabilization account plan is used to spread the high cost of shipyard overhaul and dry docking activities over several budget years, just similar to uh, what the SPA uh, did. So for this, MOSA was actually used uh, as a segregated account that equitably saved for and allocate the cost of major um, regulatory overhaul and planned uh, intermediate maintenance. And that is listed in the MOSA plan. It could be used for efforts beyond the capacity of the facility crew and may require contractors. And it also is, it was used for some synchronized repair and maintenance to the user and uh, funders through the ship day rate structure. It wasn't intended for any emergent repairs or casual breakdowns. So we, um, Gemini is another example of the uh, inclusion as part of O&M budget. So uh, Gemini titled theirs Instrument Development Fund, and uh, we'll be having a video later from uh, Ruben Daz, uh, Ruben Daz, and he'll be telling us uh, about um, the IDF, which is the Instrument Development Fund. Gage is another example, and we'll be hearing directly from Rebecca Bendik and um, LIGO, another, and Hannah will be speaking to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I will have to call on Hannah Henson. She's uh, from LIGO and uh, she's the LIGO Laboratory Business Manager and she has been with LIGO for over eight and a half years. Hannah will be pleased to have you up here to tell us what you've done in the past. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> hey, hi everyone. I'm Hannah. Can you hear me? Okay. So the LIGO lab has a operations and maintenance award that's on a five-year renewal cycle. And we're actually just preparing um, our next five-year cycle. And so we complete a facility condition assessment report every year as part of, well, sorry, every five years, not every year. <laughs> Um, as part of a deliverable. And we did that during the current CSA, and that's going to inform the next five-year budget plan. Um, so this is, it goes through, they give you a whole list of projects. We prioritize those projects, and then we build our five-year O&M budget. So some of those types of projects, roofing, chiller replacement, road maintenance, lighting, um, recently, we started to identify site vehicle replacements um, at the Hanford Observatory. We used to have GSA vehicles. We can't have those anymore, so we had to actually purchase our own vehicles. So part of those replacements is going to be included in our future budgets. Um, vacuum, those are one-time expenses anticipated to preserve the vacuum system. Um, the list of PLMP projects, um, those are the Pro project lifecycle maintenance plan projects are always greater than the available budget. Um, I think we probably all share that problem. Um, so we prioritize based off of factors um, that prioritize the facility scientific capabilities. Um, then we take those deferred projects and we keep them on our budgetary liens list to monitor them. 
And on that liens list, they are in order of priority. So in the event that we suddenly have a windfall of money, then we can also <laughs> review that list at that time. Uh, to date, we have received one supplemental award. Um, that was in the fiscal year 2017. Uh, stage and then the work was completed and into 18 as part of our last five-year cooperative support agreement. Um, and that was to address the sustainability of the vacuum systems. So as part of that, we identified approximately nine different unique tasks um, and estimated those costs uh, individually, submitted that proposal to the NSF. We were reviewed, so we requested 4.35 million and we were awarded two and a half million. The main item that was deferred was 1.2 million in scope related to a bean tube crack repair and sealing at the LIGO Livingston Observatory. So through budgetary change control on our this five-year O&M award, we were able to fund this project in 2022, but this was only mainly due to Caltech foregoing annual salary increases in 2021. So during the pandemic, uh, Caltech froze salaries, and so we didn't have any annual salary increases. Of course, this is not a sustainable approach. So I was asked to talk about some benefits of including these types of projects in our O&M award um, versus the supplemental. So with O&M, it does allow for us to have a cohesive management plan with one WBS structure and budget. Staff can also be planned against the specific tasks. So when we plan out our staffing plan, we ask supervisors to go through and identify which staffs are working on which tasks. And then that's how we build our basis of estimate for our staff plan. So if that's gonna be in a supplemental, it's hard to do it all together. Some O&M challenges. I mean, anytime that you have a pool of budget, even if it's identified for very specific tasks, it's easy for other things to take priority when they become you know, a fire drill, something unexpected happens. So you realize a risk and you need to fund it. Um, so that is one of the challenges is that some of those projects could potentially be deferred. Some supplemental benefits is, of course, we're open to accessing additional funds from the NSF if they're willing to give them to us. Um, some supplemental challenges, and of course, this depends a little bit on what recapitalization means. When Stella and I originally talked, I had one definition and it has changed in the last week or so, and it's a little bit more clear now, but I'll, uh, I have lots of questions on the next slide. But some challenges is that past experience indicates that a supplemental award is is likely to be less than what we're asking for, and so it forces triage elsewhere within the o and budget. Uh, removing the funding request from the main five-year O&M proposal and expecting a future supplement introduces risk if O&M is relying on receiving that full amount of supplemental funds. Um, are the supplemental funds going to happen proactively or do we need to ask for them as something arises and becomes more of an emergency? Um, we don't want to be in a reactive management mode. We would rather be proactive. So that's because it's not as efficient. We don't want downtime. And obviously costs for emergency repairs are more than when you go out and actually get bids and have time to do the work. Um, also, the additional proposal developmental process, we all have limited staff. There's reviews that we go through internally, collecting all that information and getting people to write the actual narrative. And then you submit it and then you have another review. So I, maybe some of these questions are for Matt and Stella, but this was on the original definition. You know, so we were just curious about what is a portfolio of investments? What does unfunded parts mean? And I noticed that the definition has changed and cleared some of that up, but some questions for maybe Matt and Stella and others to contemplate as part of this discussion. So. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, we'll definitely take a look at your um, questions later. We we'll want to save time and uh, run through the presentation so we'll have enough time to really dialogue because that's the reason why we are here. It's not more about the presentation, it's more about hearing from you. Thank you. So up next, I'll have um, Rebecca Bendig come up um, 
She's the president of the University NAFSTA Consortium, then seven since 2020. She has a background in geodesy and um, geophysics, studying active tectonic and geologic hazards. So she'll be telling us uh, more about what they are doing and practicing with GAGE. Thanks. Thanks, Stella. So um, you all will hear a little bit more tomorrow morning about what GAGE does uh, in detail, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, it's important to note that the GAGE facility primary role is to own and operate um, a dispersed sensor network. So we don't have big complicated buildings like many of the other large facilities. So for us, recapitalization is really about um, replacing and upgrading sensors in that instrument pool. And what that means, which makes sort of our life around the recapitalization slightly easier than some maybe, is that it's extremely scalable. Um, you know, we can replace one instrument or we can replace 3000 instruments. Um, so we have this flexibility and recapitalization that I think may not apply um, to all of the large facilities. And as a consequence of that, we're maybe pursuing some more novel approaches than some. So I thought, you know, we do use our annual operations and maintenance budget to replace a, a sort of rolling set of instrumentation annually. And we do pursue uh, recapitalization through the supplemental request, but I think many of the facilities do this. So I thought I would emphasize two things that Gage is doing that are a bit different um, and, and maybe we're able to because our operational model is a bit different. One of them is to pursue um, innovative partnerships in order to bring in um, support for the scope that we uh, currently support. And at the moment, we have a one long-standing interagency agreement with NASA that supports some elements of gauge operations. And then we have a brand new interagency agreement with the USGS um, that's just recently come online. And for that, I have to offer huge kudos to our program managers and the NSF staff who did an incredible amount of work in negotiating those interagency agreements. But we see um, a landscape going forward where partnerships, like structured and codified partnerships throughout the federal government from agencies who have interests in the operation of a particular large facility, in this case, the sensor network run by GAGE, is an important way forward to make sure that um, our infrastructure is sustainable over the long periods of time that those stakeholders need that infrastructure to be operational. So we have um, a growing component of budget for recapitalization that comes from interagency agreements and partnerships across multiple federal agencies. The other pathway that we have pursued in the past at a small scale, but hopefully is also growing, is by looking at program income through technology transfer and commercialization activities. So there are some components of the data and data products and infrastructure that the GAGE facility supports that have multiple uses simultaneously for scientific research and for more commercial um, and technology transfer related activities. And so we've started small with some small pilots that allow um, very limited program income under our cooperative agreement, but we anticipate that that program income can, there's potential for it to grow over upcoming years. And we would prioritize at least a large proportion of that program income into recapitalization efforts. So these are two sort of more maybe out of the box um, ways to pursue recapitalization that I think um, are, are increasingly well aligned with NSF strategic priorities to support technology transfer to support science data sets that are also useful for commercial and public interest activities. Uh, and we hope that, that we can serve as a model for how to make sure that many hands make 
light work or many dollars make good recapitalization. Thank you so much. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Many dollars <laughs> make recapitalization work. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Up next, uh, we'll be having um, the ENCA, the director for the facility management for UCA. His uh, responsibility includes development and execution of capital construction and infrastructure projects supporting NSF and uh, UCA titled property. And I'll have Robert Reed come up to the stage. Thank you, sir. Aaron, I know it's late in the day today, so I'll try to be brief. Um, from a project's perspective, as we presented a little bit earlier in the previous session, we leverage our facilities condition assessment to try to identify our biggest priorities, our highest priorities based off a number of factors, whether it be age, um, like where, where the systems or equipment is in within the life cycle. But first and foremost, we, we, we need to understand, and, and it can be a challenge at times to understand the shifting programming priorities from the scientific perspective to make sure we're there to support and to make sure that we support the NSF mission objectives as well. So always been a challenge for us. Um, we, we do a fit gap on our space and facility needs but through our programming efforts. And that, that, it, that it has some heightened importance today as we begin our process of the, what the return to work looks like within our facilities and how those spaces and facilities will be used, whether they be um, retired or re repurposed, um, but to make sure that we have space for our staff members um, as they return to work, whether it be in a hybrid format or whether they work from home, we, we have to evaluate our entire space footprint and understand what that means to our organization and what the implications are from a, a, a project and a capitalization process. Uh, we define the physical needs and, and of the scopes and the alternatives and solutions to help define those projects. So um, it, it, it's, and I'll speak to this in a second, we also perform a financial fe feasibility around refresh and replace versus new versus a combination of those with pro formas and ROIs as part of that process. And then we prioritize our projects. and. We've actually recently established a governance process within UCAR uh, supporting the NCAR uh, mission and the NSF missions. We have a mission support council that the, these projects, potential projects are brought to, um, and it's a multi multidisciplinary council. And we and these projects are presented uh, and we utilize this group, this mission support council to help us prioritize that because there's always more demand that there is than there is bandwidth. And, and through the course of a year or even more, um, we're, we're redeveloping the process and intake process for our, for our scientists and, and our stakeholders to submit that activity. And it's reasonably new to, to, to my division, that, that level of governance. In the past, it was the facilities team, which is where our projects team resides under, um, would generate a number of projects and almost always facilities focused. But not always focused on mission and mission objectives, uh, both for the, the our organization and, and against the NSF organization. So um, it, it's a work in progress. Um, I can tell you what we're, um, we're developing and struggling a little bit with that whole uh, intake prioritization rubric and, ma and matrix to, to, to make some sense out of it for our staff. Because Again, our scientists, depending on what they're asking for, or what they need to, to support their, their activities, are not, the requirements are not always clear to them. And we're here, we're, we're provided, a, we're actually providing a mentor program where when, once we have the intake process, the intake documents uh, put into our system, then we, we assign them a project manager to mentor that activity, to help them through it as we, we go through whether or not um, It'll be submitted, whether or not it's you know, this year, do they have funding, you know, all the normal questions uh, that we have to deal with. So we're, we have high hopes for this project, for this program, this new program. And, and actually the organization has uh, embraced that across uh, the entire uh, UCAR operations team, um, our finance team, our human resource team, um, our IT teams all have governance groups and we all um, uh, communicate, we all sit on each other's boards. And uh, so that way they're, that we're plugged in, quite frankly, to what's needed, uh, what's needed now, what's needed in the future. 
We've also made sure we built in a, um, a, a, a safety wire, so to speak, for life safety and critical safety requirements that would immediately escalate up to our committees and, and gain, uh, go through the approval process to make sure that we can take care of these uh, those types of issues in a very timely manner. So I promise to be brief, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next, we are going to be hearing um, from Ruben Daz. It's going to be a video, so. Um, Ruben actually is the climate program scientist at Gemini, so he'll be telling us uh, more about the IDF, which is the Instrument Development Fund. Good afternoon. This presentation summarizes Gemini recapitalization and is focused on the Instrument Development Fund. Gemini International Partnership operates two emitter astronomical telescopes located in Hawaii and Chile, which are complemented by a suite of optical and infrared instruments. Gemini is the flagship ground-based observatory for the U.S. astronomical community. The international agreement signed by the partner countries states assigns the National Science Foundation as the executive agency. NOAA Lab and NORA manage the observatory through a cooperative support agreement. The international agreement defines the operations and maintenance funds, OM, and the instrument development fund, IDF, and both are provided through the CSA. In general, Gemini recapitalizes infrastructure, facilities, and instrumentation using a combination of DCSA, NSF supplemental funding, and other contributions through community-led projects. Our main source for recapitalization is the IDF, which according to the international agreement signed in December 2021, is intended to provide for instruments and their supporting systems to significantly augment, upgrade, or replace those provided under this agreement. The IDF was already used to replace a number of first generation instruments and funded instruments, including the infrared imager Spectral Flamingos 2, the Gemini Planet Imager, the high resolution spectrograph cost, and the simultaneous eight channel imager and spectrograph Scorpio for Rubin Observatory follow ups, and has funded upgrades to workhorse instruments, including Geniers and GMOS. A steady annual investment through the IDF contribution is a critical component to maintaining Gemini's scientific competitiveness and capabilities. Contributions to the IDF by partner is compensated with observing time to the partner's user community. Contributions to the IDF are on a best effort basis. The partners have to communicate their planned contributions by the time of approval of the annual budget for each year. The cost of upgrading core facilities, such as adaptive optics and telescope acquisition and guidance systems, and the cost of replacing our current uh, suite of instrumentation to remain competitive far exceed the current level of IDF contribution. As a consequence, to fund our development program, we are dependent of additional sources of income and contributions. The most important ones are the OMEN funds. Our current instrument development program depends on OMEN to fund staff working on our development program. The obsolescence program to replace outdated systems, uh, which is also funded through the OMM budget, and other funds beyond our current CSA, for example, through super, supplemental NSF funding as the GEMA award, other partner funding, for example, Kirmos Multi Object, our instrument, and both NSF and private contributions to institutes which collaborate with GEMA, as the case for the planet finding instruments Maroon X and GPI2. The IDF and one m are defined in the international agreement. The IDF differs in nature from the one m The IDF is a voluntary contribution from the Gemini partners, standardizes at 10% of the OMM contribution. Gemini is limited in the amount of IDF it may spend on Gemini staff or associated costs, and is intended to fund external instrumentation contracts. Any work 
arising out of expenditures from the Instrument Development Fund is subject to a distribution that is mindful of the responsibilities and benefits of the partners. The current Gemini International Agreement runs through 2027. The recapitalization process for instrument requires ongoing international community engagement. The partners could agree to increase the OM fund to include the IDF and place the same constraints around the portion of the OMM funds intended to pay for external instrumentation contracts. A final remark, uh, it is worth noting that Gemini competitors have different approaches. The European Social Observatory builds instruments via international treaty, while CEC Observatory uses a combination of limited CEC funding, NSF competed proposals, and pilot funding. Uh, so this is this is a, a, a set of slides put together by John McLean, who is the uh, director for the Center Operation Services of NSF's Noir Lab. So covering all the basic infrastructure, maintenance, and operations activities, kind of outside the domes, um, on our mountaintops and our base facilities in Chile, in Hawaii, and in Arizona. And uh, the Gemini parts were provided by Andy Adamson, who's the um, uh, uh, AD for the Hawaii site of Gemini. So all the ground-based uh, optical observatories funded by the NSF are now for, at nighttime, not uh, not daytime, of course, uh, are unified into this single organization called Noir Lab. So this is just a brief introduction to Noir Lab. Many of you will be familiar with these uh, programs, which have operated for some of them for more than 50 years, Gem even Gemini is now more than 20 years, uh, and our com uh, community science and data center is a more relatively recent uh, addition to recognizing the role that data plays in all of our activities. And of course, Rubin Observatory Operations, which has actually started, uh, even though we don't have the telescope running yet, we're doing pre-operations activities. So these programs comprise all the uh, scientific uh, uh, backbone of, of the new uh, lab, Noir Lab. And you can see that they're distributed uh, uh, from Hawaii to Arizona and in Chile. So we have Tololo and uh, Gemini and Ruben will be in Chile. Uh, Kit Peak is in Arizona and uh, the Gemini Telescope in Hawaii. And then uh, the CSDC has activities in, in all those locations. Uh, 70 telescopes combined over all those mountaintops. Of course, some of them are bigger than others, uh, but they all need uh, research infrastructure to be successful for us in the community. So uh, this is just a, a quick rundown of some of the obsolescence issues that Gemini and you actually, uh, well, you might have heard a part of the recapitalization, the ongoing instrumentation part was just covered by Ruben Diaz, uh, who's uh, located at Gemini South in Chile. Uh, but um, complex optical mechanical systems that many of you are familiar with uh, operated now more than 20 years uh, for the first 15 of those there was no systematic attempt to address obsolescence I think this is a theme that's maybe common to some of our older facilities they got used to running in certain ways and you know now we're trying to come up to speed and, and get with the with a modern program and that's not a criticism against Jim and I or anyone else uh, our four meters and other other uh, facilities are also catching up in this way. And, and part of it is also funding issues, uh, long-term funding issues and, and flat budgets that um, didn't allow a lot of expansive thinking. In any case, uh, Gemini put in initial proposal for supplemental funding and, and uh, received some, and then put that toward uh, uh, setting up an obsolescence program, which is now currently active. Um, it is entirely within operations and its uh, distinct program continues. Examples of things that they have covered, the secondary mirror control computer, some of you may be familiar with this, it was kind of a black box, so that required uh, quite a bit of effort on Gemini's part after they decided to um, uh, system platform lift drives, uh, detector controllers for infrared uh, instruments, issues with wavefront sensors, uh, synchrobus communications, obsolete motion controllers, et cetera. A lot of just very standard, um, uh, important uh, components of, of the overall system. 
the costs were not dominated by hardware. Mostly it was to get FTE to uh, support uh, replacement and, and understand what needed to be replaced, design new systems and, and uh, deploy them. A number of issues were cleared up, but we're still playing catch up and have not yet got back to the point where new issues can easily be incorporated into the program. I presume that means because of the overall resource availability. Uh, they have come up with a canonical number for tackling obsolescence from the start of operations at 5% of the annual cost and the initial uh, program is order of 2.5%. So it remains at that level and that just suggests that there's plenty more that we could do uh, with more resources. That, that uh, I helped John put together from prior um, uh, programs of infrastructure renewal that were not part of the overall uh, O&M budget within Noir Lab. These are actually done before Noir Lab uh, was constituted, so they would have been part of NOAO. Uh, and there were two significant programs that happened in the last uh, a little more than 10 years. Of course, the ARRA funding, we had a, about a $5 million uh, allotment from NSF. Uh, thank you very much. And also, um, when we went through the last competitive renewal for NOAO, going from 2015 to 2016, uh, we strategically worked with our NSF program officer to accumulate carry forward on the on the expiring CSA. Went forward with the new CSA and the expired one, but not expired with a no cost extension that was specifically addressed using this carry forward to infrastructure renewal projects. And these are a combination of those. So pretty major things that we could never have fit into our overall O&M budget, like major water uh, tank and water plant uh, refurbishment in Arizona. You may not know, but in Arizona, we have a catchment system on Kitt Peak, and it has a large uh, water purification system that, per, that that cleans the water that's captured from rainfall. Um, and that was like a several million dollar project to, to refurbish that whole system. Uh, we had uh, we have a 50, 60 year old building in Tucson that's the headquarters for Noir Lab now, and we did uh, some major refurbishment uh, of that building under one of these programs, and then various uh, switch gear and other large electrical uh, replacements done in Chile. So that addressed a lot of our uh, really serious problems, but now we're just at the next stage, right? Because this is already 10 years ago. Uh, so there's still many things that we are now uh, thinking about. In Chile in particular, we've uh, just completed a water uh, distribution, redistribution system uh, in, in Los Reina, the base facility. That was good, but now we need uh, more work for the water system on the mountain in Chile. Uh, power distribution systems. We just had a huge storm in Chile that some of you probably heard about about a month ago. Um, it actually shut down uh, Cerro Pachon. Uh, we evacuated all the mountains. That part isn't too unusual, uh, but it was a it was a probably a 20 or 30 year storm that's happened now for the second or third time in 20 or 30 years. Uh, but the, the outcome of that is a lot of our uh, power lines get loaded with ice and they fall down. And so we need to harden those and do a better job because these So there's there's many things like that. There's do, do, big uh, domes that need to be uh, continually um, uh, painted and, and resurfaced. So that uh, is an ongoing thing that happens every that needs to happen every ten or so years. Uh, road maintenance, Billy, and in Arizona, um, there's a big HVAC replacement uh, project that we're thinking about in Tucson, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about. Um, uh, our sustainability efforts tomorrow, because that's actually, it's actually two birds with one stone. It's really an outdated system that needs to be replaced, but it's actually gonna help us with our sustainability goals. Um, and then various other uh, just standard infrastructure things that need to be done. So looking at this, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, um, we look at no cost extensions, uh, O&M budgets and supplemental fundings, and they have all the kind of uh, typical uh, pluses and minuses that you can imagine unused carry forward for no cost extension, or it can even be done in a strategic way like we did uh, a few years ago on the NOAO CSA, uh, but it's not that useful, obviously, if you don't have the carry forward available or can't do that kind of strategic planning. Uh, in the o &M budget, it gives flexibility to um, address changing uh, priorities, but you had to somehow build that in uh, to the original CSA to make it work. Uh, I'd be very interested to talk to our colleagues at LIGO who seem to have actually been doing this already. Um, so there's some lessons learned there for sure, probably. 
Uh, and then supplemental funding, obviously always good to get a new supplemental funding, but there's not always the availability of those resources uh, when you, um, I think that I think that covers everything uh, that I, that we wanted to say in this session. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, um, I think the fun time starts now, and that is, what do you think about recapitalization? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? We'd like to hear from you before we proceed to the survey. Then thereafter, we'll take the question. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think I think recent history and 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 this whole push toward really um, really led by NSF to try and get the facilities on more of a um, how can I put this? Uh, I mean this in the most uh, positive way. I mean to get the facilities. For NSF to treat the facilities like facilities and not grants, right? There's a lot of effort been going into this over the last years, and I think it's really appreciated. And this is one of the one of the things that, at least in our in our uh, observatory, uh, that we're just starting to get to. So I described just just now the fact that in the past to do really serious, important uh, um, refurbishment and upgrade, they were kind of one offs or done in an ad hoc way, and so building in these um, uh, FCAs and then having the strategic work with the agency to provide the resources and work as a team to make this happen in a deliberate and ongoing way. I, I just think it's a, a, a great thing and I'm looking forward to, to seeing that be the future. Thank you. Any other speaker? Just tell us what you think what you like to see in the guide if this actually makes it to the guide and how will this uh, recapitalization, how will it help you? I think one thing we struggle with is the difference between that routine maintenance, what's an update, what's an upgrade, what's significant, um, where's the threshold between planning in an o and and really thinking about it from a facility recapitalization process, especially, you know, when we're talking about maybe not extremely expensive things, but a lot of them. So, you know, we, we can't replace one thing at 5,000, we have to play, replace 50 of them or 100 of them and how that fits into this. Um. We are not yet in the question and answer section, but we'd like to take that because that is really crucial. And um, I'll leave that up to my boss to handle, Matt. Matt? <laughs> yeah. You. you bring up a great point, right? Major to one facility is different than to another, right? They're all different. This is the thing we always recognize when we run one of these workshops, and I hope this is valuable to everybody. I love the gauge example, right? That was great, right? It's, you know, you know, one of the things I'm having conversations internally, Richard will appreciate this because I'm always picking on him. Some people think about recapitalization as buildings, right? It's roofs and, and right? Richard, right? <laughs> it's roofs and windows and siding and paving and, that's not why NSF funds facilities. The instruments are a big part of our thinking about recapitalization. And I love the fact that there are several presentations that hit the fact that people think of recapitalization as the science side, the instrumentation side, right? So we can't ignore that as we think about facilities condition assessments. Most standards around facility condition assessments are dealing with roofs and windows and buildings. I don't know if anyone saw the aerospace uh, uh, presentation, but it was great because they talked about, is it fit for service? Right, that's the question for scientific instruments, right? Is it fit for service, right? And so um, I think that's, these are all really great points about what, how do we define this? I think it's gonna be varied by facility, right? And what I'm hoping from this sharing of ideas about recapitalization, people think about it differently. There's many different mechanisms, right? I learned a couple new ones today that I hadn't thought about, right? Um, and so there's many different mechanisms, right? The thing is to think of the mechanism that works for your facility the best, 
right? Have that dialogue with your program officer, right? And figure out how to think about it strategically and long-term, right? Some of these things will eventually roll up to the Corps office, right? As we think about facility condition assessments holistically and get that strategic look across the portfolio. So some of it's gonna be dealt with at the program level, and some of this may eventually be dealt with in the office of the director. So Linnea, is there anything, did I, did I cover like the, the, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, and so it's this strategic view, right, that we're trying to get. So I'm really glad you brought that up because that's exactly what we're hoping to do is take it from this individual facility view to this portfolio strategic view of what our, what our infrastructure needs. So yeah, this is a great sharing of ideas. I really appreciate everyone at the, kind of at the last minute, I know, uh, pulling together their, their thoughts on recapitalization mechanisms. Thank you. Okay. Just a quick question. Can this mid-scale funding be used for recapitalization of a large facility? Yeah, sure. I think it's, you know, it, it would, a project would still have to meet the criteria of the solicitation, right? There has to be a science focus to it. It can't just be a piece of equipment with no particular science behind it. But there, in principle, there's no reason it can't be part of mid-scale. I just wanted to, to bring up something else that just popped into my head with recapitalization. Um, it, it's, it, it maybe is so obvious in, in front of me, but I, it didn't, didn't come up in this um, context until, until Matt was talking. So sometimes events can, can overtake us and, and um, we're forced to find new ways to capitalize things. And so one of the ways that Noir Lab has been extremely successful in the last decade is uh, looking to other partners to help recapitalize, especially older facilities um, that, that um, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, funding that NSF can put toward, toward facilities. And sometimes if you need something big and, and it's an older facility, you have to think creatively. And so the thing that we have done, uh, I think very successfully working in partnership with NSF was to build partnerships with the Department of Energy. And so we had the dark energy survey and the dark energy camera on the four meter in Chile. That was a $50 million project that, that DOE infused into our community. And now it's, right now, it's the most productive instru astronomical instrument on the planet. Um, DESI is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which was, um, it, we had to we had to find ways to effectively use the telescope in Kitt Peak uh, after the portfolio review, and working with DOE for a more purpose-based survey um, was an effective way to recapitalize that and provide something for our community. So there's uh, there's often ways outside your normal um, uh, thinking uh, that can can also do some of this. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Um, you can, if you have more questions, we don't have the time right now. We're just going to move straight to the um, survey. Um, if you have any question, you can definitely just uh, log on to Hoover and send us your question, or I can give you my email address. You can send me your questions and they'll certainly get you a response within reasonable time. 